Welcome back, everybody. Imagine the following. Suppose a train or a trolley car is about to run over five innocent people. Now suppose that there is a lever, there's a switch that we can flip such that it will divert the train down a side track, which will save the five people who are stuck on the track. However, if we flip the switch to divert the train, it will go down the side track and kill one innocent person. So what's the right thing to do? Do nothing and five innocent people die or flip the switch, five innocent people live, but one innocent person dies. Most people would flip the switch. Now let's throw a little twist on the story. Forget the sidetrack. Suppose over the tracks, there's a footbridge and the train is still going down the tracks, speeding down. It's going to run over these five innocent people. This time, the only way to prevent their death is to push someone off the footbridge. Suppose looking over the footbridge is a very, very large man. This man is so large, in fact, that were we to push him over the footbridge, he would fall onto the tracks and his girth would be enough to slow the trolley or the train enough so that it wouldn't run over the five innocent people. Would you push the fat man? Most people would not. But what's the difference? Before, we were willing to seemingly sacrifice one to save five, and now all of a sudden, we are squeamish. We won't do it. What's the difference between these two cases? That's one of the things that we're going to talk about today, and we're going to get the help of a moral philosophy called utilitarianism. Let's get started. So this thought experiment that we brought up called the trolley problem sometimes, it originated from the 1960s from this philosopher, Philippa Foote. She wrote about it in 1967. And it plays out just as I described. Now, we don't know who these five people are. Let's just suppose that they are stuck on these tracks through no fault of their own. And the same goes for the sixth person who's stuck on the side track. Most people are willing to flip the switch because it's a decision where we have to choose between the lesser of two evils. Anyone getting run over by a train is bad. But if the choices are five people get run over or one person, let's try to minimize the death. Let's go with one death instead of five. Now this fat man variation was written about by this philosopher, Judas Jarvis Thompson, not long after the original thought experiment. And her tweak involves this footbridge with the fat man. So again, in this one, there's no sidetrack, there's no switch, there's no lever. Instead, the only way to save the five people on the tracks is to push this onlooker, this very large person who is maybe even leaning over looking down at the tracks, were we to push him, he would fall onto the tracks and he's big enough that it would slow the train down before it would run over the five people. So if we allow for one death to save five, why is it no longer morally okay to sacrifice this fat man? Well, either we're being logically inconsistent, which for philosophers is very bad, or there's some relevant difference between these two cases. So you can pause the video and ask yourself, what's the difference between the sidetrack case, the original case, and this fat man variation? Well, articles and articles and books and books have been written about this thought experiment. It's probably the most famous thought experiment in all of moral philosophy, and one of the most famous thought experiments in all of philosophy in general. Some people think that there's a psychological factor. Flipping a switch makes us less connected to the death of the person on the sidetrack, as opposed to pushing someone. We have to make physical contact with them. And just psychologically, 
that's more difficult. Now we can make this psychological factor irrelevant if instead of making physical contact with the fat man, instead, if we can remotely knock him off the footbridge, let's say by some remote control and we are, maybe we are sitting where we're sitting now and we hit a button on our phones and some mechanical device pushes the fat man off the bridge. Would that make it, would that change your answer? It might change some of our answers, but most people would say, no, there's still something different about these cases. So the psychological squeamishness, yes, it's a factor, but it's more than that. So what's the relevant difference? Well, other people will say in the sidetrack version, we are not so much killing the person on the sidetrack as we are letting that person die. So the death is much more indirect. Whereas with the fat man, when you push someone off a footbridge to get run over by a train, that seems more direct and more like a killing. And there does seem to be a distinction here, a real difference between killing, a direct killing, and what we might call a more indirect letting die. I mean, imagine someone who is in their 90s or over 100 years old, and they're in the hospital, and there's a machine that essentially is breathing for them and keeping them alive. If we were to unplug the machine and walk away, that that's is that killing them? I mean maybe, but it the language of we let them die seems more appropriate. Compare that if we went into a room in the same hospital, different room, and we took a pillow and we smothered someone who was able to breathe breathe on their own. That isn't just letting them die, that is killing them. And arguably, even though we get a death in both cases, the killing seems worse, morally speaking. Letting someone die, it's bad someone dies, but it's worse if we directly kill them. So maybe that's what's going on in the fat man case, is it's a direct killing, and that is more wrong, if you will, than flipping the switch and just letting someone die. Now, some people will argue that no, it is killing in both cases or letting die in both cases. So that, that might not convince all of us. It makes me think of one of those Batman films from, I don't know, it's almost 20 years ago now, the, the Batman Begins, that, that Batman movie. And there's a scene toward the end of the film where Batman confronts the villain who's played by Liam Neeson. And they are fighting on the elevated train in a Chicago-like city, in Gotham City. And Batman has the villain pinned down. And he's he's got him and he's, you know, he's about to, you know, uh, kill him, I guess. And the villain kind of laughs and says, you're, he basically says, you're a superhero, you're good, you're not going to kill me, that's, that's not in your nature, I'm defenseless, and kind of laughs and thinks that he's bested Batman, but then Batman gets the, the last laugh because he essentially says, you're right, I can't kill you, but that doesn't mean I have to save you, and then walks away, the villain's pinned, stuck in the L train, and the tracks ahead have been destroyed and so the train flies off the tracks and then blows up and the villain dies i won't kill you but i don't have to save you and i think if the if the the screenplay had been written such that Batman, you know, does like slit the throat of the villain in that film. We we might not have found that acceptable. We might have found that out of character with with this this, this character, this Batman, who's supposed to be a superhero. So I 
I think whether it's the Batman case or the hospital case with unplugging the machine, there does seem to be a legitimate difference between direct killing and an indirect letting die. So that might be what's going on in the Fat Man case. Others will talk about entanglement. So we'll call this the entanglement argument. Maybe the person that's on the sidetrack, they're somehow more connected, more entangled in this inherently dangerous situation. A lot of people will say, well, the fat man on the footbridge, they kind of are there randomly. You know, if the fat man were to turn around right before we were to push him, he might say, whoa, 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 I don't have anything to do with this. You know, don't get me involved, right? I just kind of happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so to include that someone who's not tangled up in this dangerous trolley scenario, it seems unfair. Whereas the person who's stuck on the sidetrack, they seem to me they seem to be more entangled into the throes of it all. Now the person on the sidetrack say, hey look, you said I'm stuck here through no fault of my own. So uh okay, I'm tangled up in this, but again, it's not really my fault. You know, if it were their fault, you know, if they happen to be like taking a selfie on this sidetrack, not paying attention, you know, then maybe it's a little bit more okay if we flip the switch and divert the track so that they get run over. But we specify that it's they're an innocent person. It's it's not their doing for getting stuck on the sidetrack. Neither is it the doing of the people on uh, the five people on the other track. So that's the entanglement argument. And uh, one other point that's brought up is that there seems to be more of an inherent danger of being on train tracks. So even if it wasn't 100% the person's fault, I, any of the six people for getting stuck on the tracks, if they chose to kind of be in that vicinity, you know, maybe their shoelace got caught when they were walking across the tracks, got the shoelace got snagged on something. And that's not really their fault. That's just kind of a freak accident. But they still happen to be you know, in a pretty precarious situation, you know, tra- we know that trains go on train tracks, you know, especially if it is train tracks where there's, um, especially if there's train tracks where the trains go by, uh, quite frequently, then there's something inherently dangerous about being on them. Whereas being on footbridges near train tracks, it seems, okay, yeah, you're close to a train, but you're one step removed one step further away from the danger so it, there's more inherent danger toward being around train tracks compared to walking on a footbridge and so maybe if that's the case then the person on the side track somehow is more responsible for their fate so compare that story to Another thought experiment, this one was also written by Judith Jarvis Thompson in the same article. And it's the same basic idea of, is it okay to sacrifice one to save five? So this version goes like this. We'll call this the transplant case. So a healthy person goes into a hospital for a checkup and in a nearby operating room there are five people who are desperately in need of a vital organ transplant and they're going to die otherwise so maybe one of these five people needs a heart maybe another one needs a lung another one needs a kidney another one needs a liver and so on and if they don't get these organs they're going to die. And the healthy person that goes in for the checkup, the physician examining them realizes that they are a donor match for all five people such that if this healthy person's organs were harvested and then transplanted, so we took this person's healthy heart 
put it in the person who needs a heart. We took this person's healthy kidney, put it in the person who needs healthy kidney. All five people who are about to die because they need the organ, they will survive, they will live. But of course, the person who loses their heart and their liver and their lungs, um, they're probably not going to live for very long after that, right? I mean, that would be pretty cool. That would be a miracle of science. It's, oh my God, this per we took out their lungs and their kidney and their heart. They're still going. This is amazing. No, of course, they're, they're going to die. That person's going to die for sure. And, um, you know, so the if you've heard of the Hippocratic Oath, the gist of it is do no harm and so we're not allowed physicians uh, surgeons we're not allowed to just harvest the organs to violate the rights of an, an individual even if we can get something really good out of doing it even if you could save five people's lives maybe all these people are um they have organ failure again through no fault of their own so it's not like the person who needs a liver was drinking themselves to de death and the person who needs a lung that they were smoking themselves to death. Maybe they just have some genetic abnormality and uh, their organs are failing them and they were totally as healthy as they could be up until that point. So the reason why we're talking about these stories is because they pose quite a challenge to this normative view, this moral philosophy that we're going to talk about in this lecture, which is utilitarianism. And the moral philosophy is quite simple. Whenever we get to a moral decision point, we should go down the path that leads to the best consequences. And we judge consequences in terms of utility, which is pleasure or happiness. And we don't just look at the happiness or the pleasure of the individual making the decision, we have to look at all those who are affected. And so it would seem at least an unsophisticated version of utilitarianism would of course flip the switch in the original trolley problem because again, death is bad and the utilitarian definitely wants to so not only do you want to maximize pleasure and happiness for all affected you want to minimize harm suffering and death and flipping the switch certainly does that but so too does pushing the fat man because yes that person dies but it's a good deal if you will because what do we get we sacrifice one but we save five if we do nothing then five people are going to die, and those consequences are worse. We have to factor in the suffering of, the, you know, what it, the, there's going to be some pain involved be, from being run over by a train, ran over by a train, and then the death. And so we can justify the sacrifice because of how much the pleasure and happiness and life that we get out of the sacrifice. And same thing for the harvesting of the healthy person's organs. Yes, it's bad, and we are violating that person's rights, but for a utilitarian, rights are good insofar as they produce utility. Usually, for the most part, when you respect someone's rights, you make the world a better place. But in this weird case, if you violate the person's rights, their dignity, their autonomy, by robbing them of their vital organs without their consent, by the way, we... Um, you know, the person, you know, people say, what if the person decides to donate their organs, decides to sacrifice their life? Well, that's a completely different scenario and one that is less problematic and worrisome for the utilitarian. So set that case aside. We're focusing on the version where the person does not consent. But even if the person doesn't consent, the utilitarian, they might be okay with that. It's okay. They're okay with. You know, usually you'll respect rights, but you can violate them if you get something really good out of it, like saving a bunch of people's lives. So that's the utilitarian dilemma, is that the moral philosophy, it has a lot going for it. It's very commonsensical. It does seem like psychologically, just as a matter of fact, this is how we operate when we make decisions. You know, we can get a little selfish. So if you at a moral decision point, you take the path that benefits 
you the most, that's not utilitarianism, that's egoism, which I talk about in another lecture. But we're not completely selfish, at least hopefully not, and we often factor in uh, how, our, how our actions affect other people. We try to do what will be best for everyone in the long run. So we tend to act this way, not always, but even if we don't, we might say, well, this is how we ideally should act. And often that's the case, but there are these quirky scenarios where this sort of thinking seems to backfire. And then a normative view like the deontology of Immanuel Kant, which I talk about in an upcoming lecture, that seems to have a leg up on the utilitarian because someone like Immanuel Kant would say that in the fat man case and in the transplant case, it is completely immoral to push the fat man and sacrifice the healthy person because to do so is to disrespect the agency of that person. It is to treat them as an object, to exploit them, to treat them as a mere means to some end. Even if the end is good, saving five people's lives, you're not allowed to violate a person's dignity and humanity to get that outcome. It's just universally, absolutely forbidden. So in these thought experiments, it seems like the Kantian Kant's ethics deontology seems to get an answer that aligns more with people's moral intuitions. Now, as we'll see, that view has a lot of problems of its own, but in this lecture, we're focusing on utilitarianism. By the way, a lot of people, and sometimes I, will talk about this view, I, I will... I might refer to it as consequentialism sometimes. And we know that in philosophy, there's probably way too many isms, but that's just how it goes. And there's a lot of isms because there's many different schools of thought that can be quite different from each other, and we need names for them. Utilitarianism is a form. It's a type of, it's a sort of consequentialism. So in ethics, consequentialism... Consequentialist theories are theories that judge moral actions on their consequences. That's why it's called consequentialism. And with utilitarianism specifically, the kind of consequences that you want are the ones that generate the most utility, happiness, pleasure, not just for you, but for all affected by the action in question. So we'll see with Kant's moral philosophy that it is not a type of consequentialism because Kant knows, Kant knew that so often we don't have control over the outcome and consequences of our actions. And so we should focus more on what we have control over, what we have more control over at least, which is what we try to do, what we intend to do. So that's one of the big differences between these theories that are often pitted against each other. Do we judge actions more on how things play out, the consequences, or more on what goes into them, the intentionality? And if you look at our criminal justice system, which is a reflection of our morals, moral values, you know, at least the American criminal justice system, American moral values, it looks like we care about both consequences and intentions. So think about successful murder or murder in the first degree, which is a kind of successful murder, attempted murder, and manslaughter. Murder on purpose, successful murder, attempted murder, and manslaughter. And think about them in terms of intention and consequences. When you compare attempted murder with successful murder, the intention is the same. The person tried to kill someone. The only difference is in the consequences. The attempted murderer failed, but the successful murder murderer didn't fail. That person 
killed someone. So we have we end up with a dead person. If you compare manslaughter with successful murder, consequences are the same, aren't they? There's a dead person. But the difference is with the manslaughter case, there was no ill will. The person, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's maybe it's vehicular manslaughter. The person was driving their car, trying to be as safe as possible, and then someone jumps out in, in the street and they get run over and they die. So we end up with the death, just like in the successful murderer case. But no one tried to kill it. There was no attempt at someone's life. So in those two cases, the consequences are the same, but the intention is different. If you look at how we dole out punishments for each of those three, we do factor in both the intentions and the consequences. So attempted murder, you still get some sort of punishment. Now, if we were strict consequentialists, if we were strict utilitarians, then we might let the attempted murderer just walk. You know, especially if the attempted murderer could show us that they were never going to try to kill someone again. You know, that's hard for them to prove. But let's say they've got a crystal ball. They can say, look, here's the future. I did try to kill this person, but in the future, I'm never going to try to kill anyone again. The utilitarian, they might say, well, there were no bad consequences. And it looks like... Um, imprisoning you would not prevent any further harm you know, so at best they would they might say well we're still going to imprison you as a deterrent to, for other people so uh utilitarians they can they can punish people if it serves as a deterrent because if if throwing someone in jail prevents or deters someone else from harming someone we can factor that in because we're making the world a better place but if we could see in the crystal ball that the imprisonment it would not prevent any harm in the future, then we would have no basis to punish the person just from the the intention alone. The Kantian has the reverse position. They will look at successful murder and attempted murderer, attempted murder in the same light because the intention was the same. Now that's that strikes many of us as funny because most of us want to say that even if both attempted murder and successful murder deserve some, at least some punishment, at least some prison time, let's say, that's just, it doesn't have to be, there's many different forms of punishment, but, um, you know, that's a common one, obviously. We'll, we'll say something like, well, okay, attempted murder, maybe you get five, ten years in prison, but successful murder, we got to do more, maybe even life in prison, maybe even the death penalty. But if you're going to be a strict Kantian, then the punishments probably have to be the same because we're only supposed to judge moral actions based on their intention. And the intention, the attempted murder was trying to kill someone. The successful murder was trying to kill someone. They just were able to do it. And so if that's our only criterion for punishment then they they probably deserve the same punishment if again if we're a strict Kantian so it's, it's interesting to look at these two views and as a matter of fact as a matter of policy there's probably a little bit of both you know like in our criminal justice system of course as you know what is criminally wrong and what is morally wrong, those often converge, but not always. You know, so you could be unfaithful to a romantic partner. You know, you could cheat on your boyfriend or girlfriend, but can they call the cops on you? Did you break the law? Uh, a lot of times, no, but, you know, it's, it's morally bad. You know, you shouldn't do that, but it's not illegal. Same thing with, with lying, you know, breaking a promise to a friend. More often than not breaking a promise it's morally bad we would say but you know can you call the cops on your you know you promised to pick me up at 5 p.m and 7 p.m you didn't come you know i'm calling nine i'm calling 9 the cops are going to come arrest you for for breaking your promise no that would be funny but uh, that's not going to fly right all right before we get more into the theory of utilitarianism let's do 
an updated version of the trolley problem and we're going to tie in the ethics of technological advancements. So let's say instead of trolleys, we have self-driving cars. So this is what's cool about philosophy is yes, many times, maybe most of the time, it's very abstract and it doesn't apply in a day-to-day -day situation. But this sort of scenario, it totally applies. It totally applies to what actual human beings should do. You know, the people that have jobs in Silicon Valley, these big tech companies, they're going to have to think philosophically if they are going to come up with self-driving cars, let's say, that are programmed in the best way. So, so case in point. Let's say the programmers of a self-driving car, you know, so like a, the latest model of a Tesla and you're Elon Musk and you have to decide how do you want to program the self-driving car in the following scenario? The car is about to run over five people. So it's going to sound like the trolley problem, right? And suppose that the only way to avoid the car running them over is to swerve so instead of a sidetrack it's a side road so we see here alert collision unavoidable switching to optimal route route it, how how would you pro, how would you program the self-driving car in this scenario would so it either it either goes down the path and runs over the five or it swerves and kills this one person. Let's suppose those are the only two options. So instead of to be or not to be, it's it's to swerve or not to swerve. So you might say, oh, but what if what if we swerve to the left? You know, let's just say that's just not possible for uh, for whatever reason. It either goes straight, kind of does nothing, or it swerves to the right and kills this one person. Now this seems like the original trolley problem. Seems like the correct way, the morally way to program the self-driving car. And notice. There's no handbook. There's no, there's, it's not like you can solve an engineering problem or a computer science problem that will give us the answer of how do you program this self-driving car. So this, this is not a factual matter. This is not an empirical question. This is not a question that the scientific method is going to answer. So the sciences are, they're, I'm a huge science fan. In, in fact, in you know, before I was a philosophy major in, in high school, I, I was more of a math science person than a humanities person. And um, I was just astonished by all the things that science could do and technology and the, the scientific method so powerful. And it's made the world a better place in a lot of ways. But there are there's still limits to it. You can do science until you're blue in the face, but you're not going to get an answer to the question, What's the morally right way to program the self-driving car? It's not that you have to hire philosophy majors or philosophy PhDs to address this question, but it is the case that you have to think philosophically. You have to think ethically. You have to think critically to answer this sort of question. So you, again, you can do science forever. You could use the scientific method over and over again. You're not really gonna get an answer to this question and that's because the sciences they're not just they're not they're, they're they're really really great at answering empirical questions but this is a philosophical question this is a question about values and ethics that goes over and above the empirical so most people would say look i don't want anyone to die but if it is one death or five deaths then we the car should swerve okay but what if we tweak the thought experiment, just like we introduced the fat man version earlier? Suppose the scenario is this, a self-driving car is gonna run over five people. Now suppose the only way to save those five people is to push a sixth person into this crosswalk. 
let's say. So just like we had to push the fat man, what if the only way to save these five people is to push this sixth person, again, innocent person, um, they don't deserve to be pushed. But if we do push this person into the crosswalk, the self-driving car will run into this person. It'll be enough to deflect or slow the car down enough so that the five people here will survive. So again, most people are willing to say the morally correct way to program the self-driving car is to have it swerve. But would you be willing to push the one person into the crosswalk, killing them, sacrificing them, let's say, to save the five? Most people wouldn't. And again, we have the same potential relevant differences. It's There's the psychological squeamishness problem. You know, it's much easier just to program a car and walk away than it is to physically push someone. But we could make that irrelevant if we, the same thing we do with the, the fat man version. So what if we remotely have this person pushed? So we push a button on our phones at home and you know, some robot or something pushes, you know, maybe another self-driving car rams into the person and pushes them in the, the path of the, the self-driving car over here. But that still most people that might help some of us that gets rid of some of the, the squeamishness that we have, but a lot of people. So no, and again, it might be more of a direct killing than a letting die. Okay. It's a little comedic relief. Why have philosophers been tearing their hair out trying to solve this trolley problem for the last 75 years or so when this toddler has figured it out? So watch this. Uh-oh, Nicholas. This train is going to crash into these five people. Should we move the train to go this way or should we let it go that way? Which way should the train go? Oh, either that kid's a genius or he's going to grow up to be a serial killer. Let's keep our eye on that one.